places, everyone. Good morning. Call to order the special meeting of the Oak Island Planning Board for September the 7th, 2022. Um, we have one member absent and one vacancy, but we do have a quorum. And uh, of course, the purpose of this meeting is twofold. Uh, we'll have some training from the CAFER Council of Government, who also has our UDO audit, and we'll be uh, taking a further look at that as well this morning. So uh, with that, uh, <clears throat> Wes, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Board. Um, I think we've got two new members here today, correct? Right. Um, just... Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Wes McLeod. I'm with Cape Fear Council of Governments. I'm the local government services director. Um, as, as the chair mentioned, uh, we're do going to do a training uh, today as well as uh, start off the, the audit process for the UDO. Um, we will need to somehow get the training slides on the... There we go. All right. Okay. So um, we provide uh, trainings for local governments throughout our region. We do these very commonly. Um, in particular, uh, we do these for, for planning boards and, and boards of adjustment most often. Um, and, and so I, this will also be helpful for you all, I think, as, as part of the audit process and understanding kind of the framework uh, for planning and development regulation in North Carolina and why maybe there's su suggestions for XYZ this or XYZ that um, in, in the UDO uh, audit. Uh, that being said, I'm going to jump right in here. This is uh, informal training, so if you have questions, let me know. I know that many of you, well, at least three of you, have been on the board for quite some time, um, so I know some of this may be material you've heard and you're familiar with, so I apologize for that. Um, but it's always, I think, a helpful refresher. Um, so when we conduct these trainings, one of the first things that we typically like to do is explain just the legal context uh, for our local governments. I, th I think a lot of people are, are sometimes unfamiliar um, with our, our inherent authority, authorities and, and powers. Um, and so across the U.S., there are, um, there are two different types of states, those being home rule states and Dillon's rule states. And so it's important to remember that our local governments are creatures of the state and they have no inherent powers except those powers that are given to them um, by their state legislature. In North Carolina, um, we are what's referred to as a modified Dillon's rural state. And so um, that's particularly critical for us to understand as we make changes to our ordinances or we want to adopt some new rule or policy. Um, because in a Dillon's rural state, basically the state legislature tells us what we can and can't do um, strictly. Now, we have a little bit more authority than, than your standard Dillon's rural state, but our General Assembly will be very quick to tell us, no local government, you're not allowed to do this. Um, and, that, and that has happened with um, a good deal of frequency over the last um, decade or more. Um, recent proposal, for example, that came forward through the state legislature was to say, Local governments, I don't think that you have the authority to um, regulate tree removal um, unless you have special legislation. So I hope that makes sense as, as why it's important to, for us to understand when, for example, I may make a recommendation here to say, hey, I don't think that you guys should be able to do this or, or X, Y, Z. It's not necessarily saying Wes thinks it's, it's possibly in violation of, 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 of state law. Um, and just so you know, home rule states, it's, it's sort of the opposite. You can more or less enact any rule, ordinance, policy, et cetera, so long as it doesn't violate the state or federal constitution. These are um, most of our states um, up north, for example, uh, and, and a lot of our states further west. So not to, you know, talk about our folks coming from 
the north to the south, but sometimes there's a different understanding of how we can do things where we've come from that is in conflict with the way that we're allowed to do things here from a planning and zoning standpoint. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything you want to add to that? Yes. And, and Matt, please uh, jump in here uh, where, where you feel it's important. So the other thing is found, foundational. There's, I'm, we're going to talk about uh, land use decisions. There's four different types of land use decisions. And this really helps understand also the framework within which the planning board, town council, uh, and the UDO administrator function. The first... Uh, those are, are, are being our legislative decisions. Those are your policy decisions that would include, for example, adopting a budget, but also any time that you rezone a piece of property or modify the, the text of the zoning ordinance. They, they're legislative decision and that the, the decision, the final decision making authority lies with the governing board. And the other key with a legislative decision, uh, different from other decisions, is Anybody can come out and talk about why whatever particular rezoning is a good idea or a bad idea. And in that sense, the governing board, in this case the town council, can take into account any of that, um, any of that uh, discussion by the public and say, hey, you know what, You're, you guys are right. Uh, we don't, we don't want to approve this. Um, and the other piece of that is typically... Um, the, the wisdom of the governing board or the town council in this, in this case is not typically questioned at the next level. So if someone is displeased, for example, that the town of Oak Island denied a rezoning or they approved a rezoning and they want to sue the town or, or, or bring forth some court action, the judge at Superior Court is going to say, well, who am I to necessarily question uh, the town of Oak Island's wisdom on this? Now, if there's a procedural issue, that's another matter. But the, you, you're typically not going to find that someone is questioning the elected officials from a legislative decision. Because of that, you also have much broader discretion to approve or deny something. Not, you don't create precedent. All these types of things uh, um, are afforded uh, our legislative decisions. You all do not make legislative decisions, though, but you're, you're part, part of them uh, in that you are the advisory board for those legislative decisions. Um, so in North Carolina, any time that there is a text or a zoning map amendment, um, you are required to make a recommendation uh, on that text or zoning map amendment and provide a statement of consistency with your land use plan. That, that is an advisory decision and these are, of course, not final decisions, and they are also, therefore, not, uh, therefore less regulated. Planning boards across our region um, are afforded this authority. They, they, they make advisory recommendations on a host of things. In particular, text amendments is what you guys do most often. Uh, but here, you also make advisory recommendations on certain plans, major site plans, and subdivision plats. Those are, those are, nothing has occurred as a part of that advisory decision. There's been no final decision occurred. You guys have just made an advisory recommendation, hey, we like this, or no, we don't like this. If someone is mad at the planning board because you uh, made a recommendation to approve something, they can't necessarily appeal it to the Board of Adjustment or appeal it to the Superior Court. Nothing has actually happened. So uh, I, I, hope that's, I hope that makes sense. The third type of decision is our administrative decision. These are um, routine activities that in many cases are handled, most cases are handled by staff, but there are some <coughs> items uh, of administrative decisions that are handed, handled by uh, planning board, boards of adjustment, well, not board of adjustment, planning board, boards of commissioners, governing boards, et cetera. Um, so anytime, for example, that Matt or his staff are to issue a zoning permit. That's an administrative decision. Uh, or a sign permit. That's an administrative decision. Um, in, the, in the instance here in, in Oak Island, there are also administrative decisions that are approved by the town council. And those are 
decisions on major subdivision preliminary plats and major site plans and, and also major final plats as well. Not finals. Okay, it's just prelim. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, the key with administrative decisions and where our local governments get ourselves into trouble from time to time is if I come forward as an applicant for a subdivision plat or a major site plan, and I have met the terms of that ordinance, you, it has to be approved. I, I have met that burden. There is no discretion that can be applied in that, in that approval process. And so that can sometimes be, um, be problematic uh, because I may uh, apply to, to do a subdivision that is gonna make a whole lot of people angry. But so long as I meet the terms of that ordinance, the local government is bound to approve it. So the key being that if you guys are, don't want to allow that type of subdivision, then you need to modify the rules on, on, on the front end, not after the fact where, when I've come in and, with, and, and, I've, and I've provided my application that meets the terms of the ordinance. Now you can, the local government can deny it, and we have, we have a great many examples of, of this, um, but I, I'm going to have my attorney take local government right uh, to superior court, and the superior court judges say, "Hey, that's an administrative decision. You had no right to uh, deny that," and and we'll remand uh, we'll remand it back to the local government to approve it. So um, that's very important um, and can be a difficult thing to understand for for our folks. Fourth is quasi-judicial. These are your formal actions where decision makers apply discretion. Um, these are court-like decisions. Uh, there are very specific rules and procedures for how these quasi-judicial decisions are made. Uh, these are typically under the purview of the Board of Adjustment, uh, but also special use permits are done in a quasi-judicial uh, procedure, and those here in Oak Island are under the purview of the Town Council. So we're not gonna talk about those very much, but um, those, are, those are typically the most, are the most complicated of the four. Okay. Matt, uh, Wes. Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> going back to the administrative, mm -hmm. um, if there's a, <clears throat> a challenge to an administrative action, would that not first go to the Board of Adjustment and then go to Superior Court? It depends on what it is. So if it's a subdivision decision that's uh, at, the, at the governing board, um, there, unless it's explicitly written in your ordinance, it can go straight to Superior Court. But yes, if it's a major site plan or if it's, if it's uh, for example, a zoning permit was denied by the UDO administrator, that then goes to the Board of Adjustment first. Uh, and the Board of Adjustment decides whether or not the administrative decision should have been um, upheld or, or overturned, et cetera. But thank you, that's a, a, a good distinction. Um, often it's, it's a, has been occurring in our region in regard to subdivisions, that, and there's a clause in the statute that allows it to go straight to Superior Court. Okay. I don't remember if you guys have it written up that appeals of subdivisions go to Board of Adjustment first. Of my head. Okay. It's questionable whether, and I'll also say this, it's a little bit of a gray area whether a local government can say that appeals of subdivision decisions have to go to the Board of Adjustment um, because the statute says that they can <coughs> go straight to Superior Court. So I always defer to local government counsel on how they want to handle that, how they want to put that provision in, in, in place. Okay, so just some basics about planning board. You guys have your own statute, 160D-301, that talks about how, you know, your makeup. Um, you, you're, you have to be uh, three members mi minimum. Um, all of your meetings are subject to open meetings requirements, so that means uh, that, for example, you cannot email amongst yourselves about particular items concerning um, the town's business. Um, but there are other details that are left up to the discretion of a local government. For example, how many members are to be on the board if non-residents, for example, 
uh, can participate? Are there certain qualifications uh, of the planning board members? And then, of course, uh, how you handle terms, vacancies, and attendance, and the like. That that's all that's all local policy uh, that you can put in put in place uh, for for your planning board. And there are also a number of responsibilities and authorities that are outlined in statute as well. Uh, and these have evolved um, over the last um, 70 or 80, 80 years. Um, first being dealing with preparing and reviewing uh, the town's um, uh, comprehensive plan. And the second, um, facilitating and coordinating citizen engagement. Third, developing and recommended policies, ordinances, development regulations, and administrative procedures. This is often what most of our local governments in the region are doing. You guys are t looking at ordinance amendments, text amendments, you know, quite often. Uh, obviously, you, you, you are also reviewing development approvals, but most of our folks are spending most of the amount of time on ordinance-related items. And then fourth, um, uh, sorry, sorry, fourth is actually what I was referring to. Uh, advising the governing board concerning um, reviewing and commenting on all zoning and tax text amendments. That's also in 160D-604, that's outlined. And now with the, the adoption of, of 160D, any time that there is to be a amendment to your comprehensive plan, that also has to go to you as well similar to a text or zoning map amendment. That was not formally the case. Fifth, exercise any functions in the administration and enforcement of various means of carrying out plans that the governing board may direct. Um, this is a new modification after, after the results of 160D to provide a preliminary forum for review of quasi judicial decisions. Uh, a lot of our local governments historically, special use permits would be issued by the governing board after a review and a recommendation from the planning board. The, um, that's still allowed. It used to be that way here, I believe. That's since been removed. But the General Assembly has now said specifically, they've added the clause at the end of six there, it says, provided that no part of the form or recommendation may be used as a basis for the site for the deciding board. In other words, it is you more or less a waste of everyone's time. Uh, with, 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 you know, that's uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if those are the proper words, but that's essentially what they've said, and probably not a good idea to do. And then seven is to perform any other related duties that the governing board direct. Um, you got to remember that many many years ago. There wasn't a UDO administrator or a MAT or other staff, and that in fact the planning board was doing a lot of the functions that our local government staff now does. And so because of that, some of these authorities and responsibilities may seem a little odd to you. Well, we don't do that or we haven't done that. We don't prepare the comprehensive plan. Well, many, many years ago you may have. Um, the statutes just haven't necessarily been uh, all the way modified to reflect that. Okay, so let's talk quickly about, uh, and I think that that many of you guys are familiar with this, but um, there are certain um, approval authorities and requirements that are that are outlined um, in statute. Um, so anytime there's a there's a text amendment or a zoning map amendment, the planning board provides a recommendation to the governing board. Uh, for final approval. That, you guys are familiar with that. There's also a statement of consistency that, that needs to coincide with that recommendation. So not only is it a recommendation, but it's also a statement of, of consistency with, with your comprehensive plan. Typically staff prepares that. That doesn't mean that that needs to be the final statement, but that can be a starting point for where you may go. Is that, that how you guys have been handling that, Matt? the consistency statement, if you've been preparing those yes. for their review, okay, subject to their discretion. Um, when there is a zoning map amendment, there also needs to be a reasonableness statement uh, by the governing board, but not necessarily the planning board. 
we said this prior, but um, not exactly in these certain terms, but um, an applicant, citizen, whoever, they don't have a right necessarily to amend your ordinance. Um, and so, you know, because of that, the governing board has pretty, pretty broad authority to approve or deny. And in the same sense, you as planning board has pretty broad authority uh, to say, we don't like this text amendment or, or, or we do like this text amendment or we don't like this rezoning or we do like this rezoning. I will say the statute does say for planning board that if 30 days have transpired without a report to town council, then town council can act without necessarily uh, taking into account your review and recommendation. And the other piece of that, and there's probably a, a, a slide that says this is, if you guys, for example, find that a rezoning should be approved or you recommend approval, the governing board, in this case, the town council can say, actually, we, we disagree. And it, it doesn't necessarily matter that, that you have a differ, differing set of opinion uh, than, than the governing board. You guys have been worked pretty closely in lockstep. Typically, if, if it's a, 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 a recommendation for approval, oftentimes it will be approved here. We have other local governments that do not see eye to eye between the planning board um, and the town council. We mentioned this prior, I think. Uh, appeals and variances are always heard by the Board of Adjustment. Um, special use permits, uh, depending on the local government, that may be the governing board, the planning board, or the Board of Adjustment. Um, and then major subdivision preliminary and final plats, that can be um, you know, the, in, any of those uh, different boards. Um, further west of here, we have um, subdivision approvals that are oftentimes discretionary. Uh, here in southeastern North Carolina, I don't believe that outside of possibly Belleville that, that anyone has subdivision approval that's not administrative, meaning if it meets the terms of ordinance, it has to be approved. Do you know of anybody that has this? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so minor subdivision plats, which um, which is the same, for example, as, as site plans from an administrative standpoint. It can be any of the above. Oftentimes, minor subdivision plats will be approved by staff or the UDO administrator so long as the proposal meets the terms uh, of the ordinance. Question about those, those approval authorities and, and how that proceeds. Again, this somewhat relates to us being a Dillon's rule state. You guys can't, for example, say, hey, well, why don't we be the ones to approve uh, rezonings or text amendments? Unless you apply for special legislation, you have to follow the statutory procedure. Brunswick County does do that. For example, their planning board does approve, um, approve um, uh, zoning, rezoning applications, zoning map amendments. Well, in the... Um <clears throat> the draft UDO had planning board doing final approval for some things as well, but that was that was changed. taken away. Yeah, got it. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Much to my delight. Okay, got it. Um, and there's we'll have some discussion about that in in the uh, in the audit. Um, so for you all, in terms of your your decision making responsibility. Um, specifically, um, you all obviously provide advisory recommendations on uh, for text or zoning map amendments, and then advisory recommendations for major site plans and major subdivision plats. Ultimately, then those are approved by the town council. In your ordinance, specifically, in in regards to those, there is a clause that says that the planning board shall forward the recommendation in forty five days per five. Uh, 5452. Just want to mention, mention that. In other words, um, if I submit a subdivision proposal and it's, it stays here for 90 days, I may be able to be, as, as an applicant, say, folks, you, you're in violation of, of, of these due process provisions and, and take, try to proceed with some type of action. So <clears throat> it's critical on, on staff, and it's a good thing that you have Matt here to make sure that when he receives an application, everything is complete. Because the way Matt operates and also the way I operate is I typically um, 
or, or I will not bring something to one of my planning boards without that application being complete and otherwise basically meeting the terms of the ordinance if it's an administrative approval. Does that make sense? So if it's like a subdivision plan or a site plan, Matt will have already had multiple back and forth with, with, with applicant. There'll be multiple um, different agencies involved depending on who it is or internal staff, um, maybe a more formal TRC process. Um, so at which point in time it gets to you, you all should really just be a backstop and say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, is this there? Everything should be there. In other words, the application should already be ready for approval um, at which point in time it gets to you and, and, and then forwards to uh, town council. Anything else you want to add to that? No. Um, as Wes mentioned, uh, I, I have worked on several TRC uh, processes, and that's something that I'm trying to implement here as well. So uh, as he mentioned, by the time it gets to you, I will have me and several other agencies will have had uh, a lot of back and forth and comments with the applicant to get them to address uh, any ordinance requirements. It's my intention that if something comes before you, uh, it's either going to be ready for approval or I'm going to tell you why it's not ready for approval based on the ordinance standards. Yeah, I, uh, again, I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that in my experience over the years, both the uh, not so much on planning board this time, but certainly on council, it was not uncommon uh, for us to get those types of proposals that didn't meet the ordinance. So, and if they get to that point and they don't meet the ordinance, that does allow grounds for an administrative approval type to be denied, but only in that event. <clears throat> yeah, and, and so, a lot of what I learned about the code was just that very thing, uh, how I became so familiar with it in doing that type of detailed work. And yeah, there were changes that were made to make it meet the ordinance before uh, I signed off on it when that was part of my responsibility. And, and that's a good point that, that Matt made. There may be some last minute item that didn't get addressed and that he feels comfortable saying and will be outlined in the staff report, hey, there's a, they, they didn't screen the buffer. If you were to recommend approval, I would recommend approval condition upon screening the buffer per, you know, whatever section of the code. Uh, now, if the code does not say anything about screening the buffer and it's administrative decision, you guys can't say, hey, uh, we're mandating that you screen that buffer. You could have a conversation about it, potentially, and if the applicant is says, I would love to screen the buffer, then they can do that, but you cannot mandate it. Um, and, that, and that goes back to, you know, some fundamental property rights and other things that, that are afforded those, those folks. But it, it I, I hate to sound like a broken record about it, but uh, across our region, we're having problems with administrative decisions and folks acting outside of, 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 um, outside of their authority and, and finding themselves in trouble um, down the road because they've denied something or required something that they, didn't, they weren't allowed to do. Okay, moving on. Um, text and zoning map amendments, and the bottom slide says the alderman, uh, which we do not have alderman here. Um, all proposed amendments to a land use ordinance or, or a zoning map, and we've mentioned this prior, this is statutory, must be submitted to the planning board for review and comment. And then the planning board must provide a written recommendation addressing uh, plan consistency, and in particular, whether a proposed amendment is consistent uh, with any adopted comprehensive plan or ad other uh, adopted plan. The alderman, in this case, the town council, are not bound by uh, planning board recommendations. So if, again, I mentioned this prior, but if they feel different than you all, then they can choose uh, to act uh, as they see fit. Um, consistency <laughs> statements can, can, be, uh, can be fairly complicated, um, but hopefully staff will at least provide you the initial 
the initial guidance on preparing those. They have to be unique. They can, you can't just say, hey, it's consistent. It needs to be based on some statement uh, that's unique to that particular project. Question was. Yes. Uh, I think I know the answer to it, but just clarification maybe. <clears throat> so let's say planning board makes some recommendation to town council for a text amendment. And town council, and there's a public hearing, which is required. Uh, and town council decides to do something more restrictive, to amend that recommendation to be more restrictive, then that doesn't come back to planning board for another recommendation, but they do have to have another public hearing or... So... That, I, know, I know if they do something less restrictive. That gets into a little bit of a legal. Yeah, how does the more or less restrictive then? Uh, 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 yeah. A little bit of a legal gray area, and, and uh, I'll, I'll also let Matt and, and Lisa weigh in on this too. But um, I, generally, I generally think of it, let me see if I can explain this. If, if the ordinance amendment, um, I'll, I'll, I'll use some type of an analogy here comes in as a Honda Accord, and then it gets modified to be a 18-wheeler, uh, maybe, maybe you want to send that back, uh, f you know, through the process and hold another public hearing. But typically, if it's pretty closely aligned and that modification is made following that public hearing process or during the public hearing process, the point of the public hearing is say, hey, folks, we got this amendment concerning this item. Um, if we modify that item, that's fine. But if we modify something wholly different, then 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 we've got ourselves a problem because we, we've we've taken off. So, <laughs> let's say we're modifying the dimensional standards for uh, R twenty. That that's a text amendment. Well, it gets to the governing board and says. You know, we need to modify the supplemental regulations for food trucks as, as part of this. That's that's that that <coughs> needs to go back through. But if the modification for the supplemental regulations are, the planning board recommends it to go from thirty feet. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Thirty feet to twenty feet, and then and then the town council goes from I think twenty to fifteen. I think that's probably fine because folks are there at the public hearing and anyone that would conceivably be impacted by that is there to speak their piece. But I, I don't know if there's an internal procedure <coughs> about that. Excuse me. I think you pretty well described how we would handle it as okay. well. Um, if you're working within the same section and on the same items, um, then the, uh, and like I said, if it's <coughs> Uh, changing it from one thing totally to another, that's when you need to come back to the planning board. But um, I mean, as you mentioned, that the, the planning board might recommend, make a recommendation, but town council is also charged with taking in comment at public hearing and using that feedback to, to help craft their decision as well. So. Anything to the contrary, Lisa? No, not to the contrary. I would just add that we really do look at the language in the advertisement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good point. How yeah. broad the advertisement is. We have had occasion um, where we needed to take a break and look at the ad and see how it was advertised to the public right. and found that it was too narrow yep. to be able to do what council wanted to do at the time, so we had to re-advertise another public hearing. That, so. and, and, and that's also a good point. I typically advise to have a, a, a broader, uh, a more broadly described um, hearing notification, but that's just me. Uh, that's up to the local government on how narrowly they want to tailor it. Um, so, did that help answer that question, uh, Madam Chair? Okay. Thank you. Wes, if I could yep. ask, and maybe ask Lisa. So, in that scenario, and I think that scenario is like a perfectly simple and good one, where the dimension says 30 and the recommendation from the planning board to the council was to make it 20. Mm -hmm. And can the council, do you guys word it enough so that the council, because to Dara's question, if you made it more restrictive, so if you made it, it's one thing to lessen the, the setback, let's say, from 30 to 20. What if you made I, it more restrictive to 32? Do you guys word it so that it could go both ways? We more? do try to make it more general, um, if nothing else, then, to keep in mind the size of the ad that we need to place, um, but also for, <laughs> to allow for that scenario. Um, you, what's coming is proposed amendments, and especially in, in a case if the planning board and staff differ 
um, what their recommendation is. Um, you know, you, you don't want to confuse anybody as to what's being considered. What's being considered are proposed amendments to these specific ordinances. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I would recommend that the, the hearing notification would say that the, the town is having a public hearing to to consider modification of the dimensional requirements for R20. Right. You know, if you're in the R20 district, you know, you may show up and, and that, that, I don't know, some folks may want to, um, make it more narrow, but I think I think that generally encompasses what what you would need to do. Okay, um, some some key considerations, just zoning in general, um, things that are not necessarily appropriate to consider, uh, and this even goes for for you know really for our uh, advisory recommendations on legislative decisions as well. Um, but you know who the applicant is you know is it a chain et cetera all those types of things um is is it going to be an owner occupied versus versus a for rent are, are these are these going to be condo units or are they going to be for rent apartment units we've got case law that says we cannot cannot differentiate between the two um is 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 going to be low income versus high income occupants now um if there's a question of property value diminution or things of that nature, that can be addressed as part of the special use permit and if an objector comes with some evidence to that effect. But only in that case. Um, folks also sometimes say, well, hey, I don't think that your project is going to be profitable. I don't think that that's going to work. Well, it might not work, but that's on them. That's not, that's not on us. Uh, you guys are just making sure that it fits within within the, the development rules and regulations. Um, folks do have certain property rights. Vesting may occur through a formal process to establish statutory vested rights, or in some cases, common law vested rights. And where this may come up most often for you all, for example, is a subdivision preliminary plat that was approved some years ago. Um, and you said final plats don't come back here. They're there to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you may notice that all of a sudden in town, uh, um, somebody's proceeding with some some development, and you say, "Well, wait a minute. We didn't we didn't we didn't give approval to this, or we gave approval to this seven years or whatever it may be ago." Well, so long as that applicant has made steps to install their infrastructure, things of that nature, even if the terms of the ordinance have changed since they got their approval, they still have certain rights to proceed as is. In addition, there are permit choice rules and regulations now in place that if I'm an applicant and I get something in, uh, apply before the town and the town says, well, wait a minute, we don't want that type of thing to happen in our town, um, I'm more or less vested on the terms of the current ordinance, even if you are to change it before the time that I would get my final approval. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so you could have projects out there, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that we do have projects that were approved years ago under different uh, ordinance regulations that still, if there are any changes or updates to that, it's based on that old ordinance. It's not based on our current EDA. So. It could be. That's correct. Could be. That's right. But, right. But they could also choose to <clears throat> make a change. They could. Um, now, if 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 they want to come back and get their project <coughs> reapproved or things of that nature, then then new ball game, right? th then then they have to come under the the new terms. But yes. I, we've, I've said this a bunch, and you guys, I think, are generally good about this. And frankly, you don't uh, you don't have final decision making authority, anyways. But if certain development proposals uh, must approve certain uh, development proposals if all ordinance standards are met, again, that can include site plans, sign permits, subdivision plats, X, Y, Z. Okay. We're getting close here. Um, there are special zoning considerations for certain types of items. For example, signs. There's been a whole bunch of litigation, particularly at the Supreme Court level, about signage. You can regulate the size, the type, lighting, but not the content, or unless you can't 
we used to historically regulate signs based on what it said to a large degree. We can't do that anymore, uh, which makes sign regulation very difficult. Um, manufactured housing, we cannot exclude those based on their age. Um, many local governments used to have standard provisions. If it's older than 10 years, you can't bring it in here. Um, can't do that. Um, single family and duplex housing, um, we cannot regulate design of those or impose a moratorium to develop ordinances, for example. And that would, that would, that would go with subdivision proposals too. So we couldn't say, hey, we need to, we need to say there's a moratorium on all, all future, to, future um, subdivision proposals uh, because our lot sizes are too small or whatever it may be. Can't do that uh, anymore. So that, those are just three, three particular items. You also have um, cell tower rules that are particular as well and have statutory exceptions um, in addition to, to these three. Anything else? Okay. Flags. Flags are a touchy subject as well. Yes, and they generally fall under signage regulations. Um, but depending on the local government, there may be exemptions for, for certain types of signs uh, or flags. And then you got a whole type of um, um, uh, HOA, uh, POA rules for how they can regulate um, signs, flags, et cetera, that's outside of the town's purview. Okay. Um, there's a lot here, but we'll, we'll talk briefly. Um, un unless approved by quasi-judicial process, um, subdivision is administrative and should be based only on adherence to objective standards. Um, again, I mentioned this prior, but subdivision approval is not the time to decide whether a project is desired. It's, it's past that point. Um, you know, you need to modify the terms of your, your zoning rules. And then subdivision, again, again, is, is generally approved by right if it conforms to ordinance standards. There can be some appropriate considerations if they're included in the ordinance standards. Um, you know, is there water, sewer, stormwater, et cetera? What, what are your open space requirements, for example, for um, each new lot? There has to be... Uh, X number of uh, uh, X amount of open space or there has to be a percentage of the entire development that is set aside for open space. Um, you can look at uh, the lot dimensions, etc. But all these things need to be spelled out in your ordinance. It can't just be, hey, wait a minute, what about this? Um, we, can't, we can't do that. Um, and then some inappropriate considerations and that these, these are items that really that cannot even be in your ordinance. Uh, discussion about um, housing size, this is for subdivision, because housing size does not come, come into play for subdivision. We're talking about lot size here, not, not zoning or development. Property values, all these particular items, um, density or school, pack, school capacity, um, and planned consistency. Those would not come into play um, with subdivision. And then conditions, if any permitted, should be directly tied to satisfying the ordinance requirements. And we, we did talk about this. This is where, hey, they've got the subdivision plat. Um, everything else is right, except it shows their sidewalk is four foot and it's supposed to be five feet. Um, in the staff report, it may say, uh, staff recommends approval of this subject of modification of the sidewalk from four foot to five foot to align with our ordinance. The ordinance says five foot sidewalk is required. We can't say, hey, there's going to be a lot of people walking there. We want it to be eight feet. We cannot ask that of them unless it was some type of conditional zoning proposal or some other type of legislative uh, process. <clears throat> but could that be approved at the four feet that was originally there? It, it would technically be in um, in violation of the ordinance standards. Could it be? Yes. Could someone um, appeal that decision? Right. 
and on the terms that doesn't meet the ordinance standards, yes. Yeah, there, there was something in our old subdivision ordinance that seemed to speak to giving town council some leeway in that regard, but I'm reasonably sure it didn't show up in the UDA. Um, so, and, and just the same way that um, you have to approve something that meets the ordinance standards, you can't necessarily approve something that doesn't meet the standards because you're violating the terms of the law. And so that's the same way for Matt. If if um, if he's issuing a zoning permit, he he can't issue a zoning permit in violation of the terms of the ordinance. It's basic, basically he he's rewriting the law as as he sees fit. Um, same thing for for town council or whoever the responsible body is for approving these administrative decisions. But if it's a mistake rather than. <clears throat> so if it's a mistake, that's where we get into some complicated territory. Um, but if it's a mistake, it's either a one-off, everybody's fine, we made this mistake, we're not going to proceed with, with making it be corrected, or we're going to correct it. Um, but moving forward, that does not set precedent for, okay, well, they got a four-foot, then I want a four-foot. No. They got a four-foot because of an accident, and the town decided not to proceed with, you know, making them comply with the terms of the ordinance. I don't know. It, every <laughs> local government handles that different, and it happens. Sure. There are things that get by that, you know, are an honest mistake. Um, but it does not legalize necessarily or modify the terms of your ordinance just because you make a mistake. Thank you. Plat versus site plan. I think you guys probably are familiar with this. Um, site plans are, so for example, say where we're sitting at, on town hall was a vacant lot. There would be a site plan that shows the locations of, of this building, where the setbacks are, what the landscaping is going to be, et cetera. Um, seeking zoning approval for that. We're not asking to divide the land for the for the for the uh, town hall. Platt is different. Uh, plats have um, preliminary and final plats, and they may be major or minor, depending on what they are. And it's a much more complicated process, for example, than just a, a standalone site plan. Um, they identify how the land is going to be divided, and then on the preliminary side, it identifies all the supporting infrastructure that's going to go in uh, to support those new homes development or whatever it may be. And it is in two phases. Preliminary plats, just like it's it's called preliminary plat, it says, hey, we're going to create this 100 lot subdivision. We're going to have roads that are this wide. We're going to have sidewalks. We're going to have whatever landscaping, and we're going to have this type of open space requirements. After I have put in my infrastructure or, if I, or I have bonded it, meaning uh, infrastructure meaning roads, water, sewer, et cetera, to support those new homes, um, then I can come in and get the final plat approved. Once I have final plat approval, it can go and be recorded at the register of deeds, at which point in time it can be conveyed to third parties. You guys could then go buy a new lot in that subdivision and build a house on it. That subdivision approval process can take quite some time. Um, you know, depending on how large the subdivision is, it could take five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 years um, to eventually be built out. All right, let's talk about conflicts of interest. This is new with, um, with 160D. It, it, also, um, it also applies... Uh, conflict of interest, you guys had provisions in your ordinance prior, I believe, um, but now uh, specifically conflicts of interest apply to our appointed boards, which would be you all in this case. You, you should not vote on anything reasonably likely to have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact on the member. Um, I mean, it has to be pretty cut and dry. For example, you need to be like a limited partner in a development um, in order to more or less recuse yourself. 
uh, or, or to have a conflict. Um, and then also, um, from a familial uh, relationship standpoint, you would also then have a conflict should you uh, choose to vote on, on, a, on an item. I will say that if there's ever a question, um, just when you get an agenda packet, oh, I, I might have a, a conflict, I might know this person, or I feel like I might have some type of financial conflict, then you should um, then you should send it up to Matt, and he'll he'll either address it or send it on to the to the to the next stage. Um, you guys don't have the, the same rigorous conflict of interest standards that that a board of adjustment has. For example, having a fixed opinion prior to a vote, things of that nature. Uh, it's mainly just family relationship and and uh, financial impacts. Open meetings, talk about this briefly, but there's a host of statutes that uh, talk about open meetings and, and how you all, how our local governments are uh, subject to them. Um, and there's, Lisa is um, the keeper of the, the open meetings procedures and trying to keep everybody straight. Um, but there's oftentimes a, a, a question about, well, what is, a, what is an official uh, meeting. Um, it is where the majorities of the member of a public body uh, uh, get together. So if you guys are at an a, event at a concert, for example, and you all happen to be there, that's fine. But if a, a quorum of you, a majority of you, huddle together and start talking about an up, upcoming rezoning approval, you are then subject to open meetings law. And you're in violation of open meetings law because you haven't advertised for that meeting and you haven't invited the public to attend. And that also goes for group text messages and emails. I'm not sure what the standing policy is here for, for emails, but don't reply all, I think, is generally a good uh, recommendation. If you have a question or you want to send something to your other board members, send it to Lisa or send it to Matt and he'll send it out to folks. Is there anything you want to add about that? Okay. Just avoid a quorum. <laughs> yeah, avoid a quorum. Yeah, that's right. That doesn't mean you can't talk to your other members, right. but but you guys can't all get together and talk about it. And and at least <clears throat> since I've been on the board and been chair, I I don't encourage um, I encourage people to not even talk to among ourselves beforehand. Say what you got to say when we get to the meeting so everybody hears it. Which is the heart of our open open meetings law. If there's government business, town business to be discussed, it should be discussed here for it to be recorded, for folks to be, yeah, that, be present. That's not a strict rule, but I do try to encourage that for the most part. Um, this We sort of just talked about this, but I will say that be very careful about emails. There is lots of FOIA requests. So, you know, if, if there's something questionable or whatever it may be, pick up the phone or whatever. Don't be emailing a whole bunch of stuff because I don't know how many, how many public information requests Lisa gets, but it's probably quite a few. Come in spurts, it seems. Come in spurts, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, that's it for, for the planning board training piece of that. Questions about any, any of that before we jump into the more exciting material? Wes, will you make um, your slide deck available to us? Mm -hmm. Matt's got it and can email it to everybody. No. Oh, you just sent it to me today. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know if folks need a break or we can jump right in. Y'all want to take five, or are you ready to keep going? Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Well, let's keep going then. <laughs> well, how do you want to proceed with the well audit piece? <clears throat> I'm mainly going to sit here so I can have my book open. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, it's hard for me to look at my book up there. Although I probably can. Um, 
Madam Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll let it, I, I mean, I can, I can start off the discussion um, just from a general framework about where we are and, and how to proceed. That would be fine. Okay. So um, I trust that everyone got their proverbial homework um, and the, the degree to which you wanted to review it, you were able to review it. Um, what, what you received and we talked about last is uh, a, an example of a, a reorganized document and then discussion about relevant code, general code sections, how they may be uh, need to be addressed as part of the UDO um, and then proceeding into the UDO itself. Um, you received um, articles one through six. Um, and so I th remember um, these are advisory recommendations. If something's in here, it doesn't mean that the town's going to haul off and start changing it tomorrow. In fact, the, the town, I don't believe, is proceeding with any of these necessarily, any of these modifications, unless there's a particular reason to do so. But this is really a, um, the introductory process to understanding where things are in the UDO that perhaps warrant change. And if there's particular policy items that need further discussion. Um, then this board, this this is the the sort of the appropriate time to engage in that discussion. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, Madam Chair, I did receive your comments. Thank you for sending those. Um, a lot of these comments are clarifying items, items where you've got conflicting provisions in the ordinance, things of that that are really items in need of cleanup to make everybody's life easier. Um, because as of now, there's things all over the place in this ordinance and it, and it can be difficult to administer. So I'll turn it back to you. We can really just sort of go from the start if you think that that's Chair. the best. Madam Chair Wesson, I'd like to interrupt. So I did do my homework, but I would like a little overview, right? I asked in the first meeting, you know, how do we not waste your time and how does the COG not waste time? Um, what I'd like to understand is, is we have all of these items, right? So could have 10 items or 1,000 items. How, how does a bill become a law? So what's the process from taking one item and saying there's a conflict here, it says 8 feet, and over here it says 7 feet. There's an item, right? It's got to get resolved, 7 feet, 8 feet, or 27 feet. So there's an item. And then we're going to have lots of these. Uh, how, do, how do we go from here to eventually changing the ordinance? And maybe you don't know, right? Because it can take different routes. But could you describe that? Thank but, but then also, what is the timeline? Uh, I asked Lisa to, to give us the series of meetings so that we could all schedule them. Because I've seen how this works, right? We, we waste time by saying, oh, I can't meet next week. I can't. Can we put together the dates that we'll meet so that we can we can all agree on them and then and then lock them in so that we don't, have, we don't miss people. Um, so what's the timeline and what are the activities of going from here to there? So, so let, me, let me answer the first question. So some of our local governments, um, they'll do the code audit. They, they'll, they'll do that. That's the only piece. Some do do these hand in hand. They'll do the, a code audit followed directly by a, a UDO update. Um, in, in that case, in, in the second case, you're setting the stage for, uh, as part of this code audit, trying to establish consensus around things that, that warrant change. If you don't do a code audit and you just haul into writing the ordinance, you can certainly do that. But you will waste a tremendous amount of time because... Matt and I may draft something that is completely without, at odds with what this board feels needs to be addressed. By going through this, it saves a ton of time on the back end and knowing what our, where our problems are and how we are to address them. Rather than me just writing something, you guys reviewing it and saying, well, why did you do that? 
we, we need to go back and, and redo this whole thing. That doesn't make sense. Um, so that is the point of this, this code audit. And if the town, for example, proceeds with, say, the result of this, because we agreed to identify, you know, several priorities, the town says, why don't we just address these priorities? That's something, for example, that staff could do, then staff would address those priorities. Or the town says, why don't we hire a consultant to initiate the full-blown uh, UDO, UDO update process that would be based upon this? Those are the two options. Um, we do have a next meeting scheduled for October 12th. 12th. Mm -hmm. The goal was when we came here to talk about um, at the close of this meeting when we would meet next in November and then potentially again in, in December or January because December is oftentimes a difficult, difficult time to schedule meetings. Okay, so I apologize if, I, if I'm just completely dumb or, or missing the point, but we, we talk about all of these items. I think what you just described was the value of a UDO audit. And we've been, we've, Chairman Royal asked for a UDO audit back in December of last year, January. So there's no question about we should have a, an audit. I'm talking about how we go from this pile of good ideas, bad ideas and dumb ideas and even better ideas into making a change, not should we do a UDO, UDO audit? That's off the table. We're doing a UDO audit. We think we should. And as far as next meetings are concerned, I would like to say, why can't we schedule a meeting in November and maybe we skip December and January and February? And, and then we'll have a final draft in March. I don't know. But, but all I get is all we can have is a meeting in October. It, what, what's wrong with scheduling out some meetings? Or why can't we do two in October? Is there a problem? What, what are we doing? I can't help but feel like we're getting the mushroom treatment, and maybe it's because I just don't understand your answers, but I don't feel like I'm getting them. The, the town agreed to do this process, and then once this process was completed, then it will be up to them, the council, the manager, and everyone else on, on how they want to proceed at the next stage <clears throat> in consultation also with the chair and staff. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have an answer about what the next stage is. Can I, can I jump in here? Um, to take care of your questions, which I'm sure we all have about next meetings and schedules, uh, Wes, if you can get with Lisa and come up with some potential dates going out uh, and then send those to all of us, that's sure. something we can handle <clears throat> with, on email and make a final decision on the meeting dates at our regular meeting next week, perhaps? Would that be acceptable? Yes, and I, and I think that we had talked about trying to hold these on the second Thursday, um, and but we had a Thursday conflict didn't. in October <clears throat> because I have a standing meeting on my calendar mm -hmm. for the second Thursday at 10 a.m. Right, right. And so y'all figure that out. Okay. Okay. We will. And get back to us. In terms of <clears throat> what comes out of this audit, it, it seems to me that uh, the, two most important items would be things that we want to remove and things resolving whatever genuine conflicts from one place to another. And so <clears throat> uh, as we're going through, uh, then my expectation would be that as we're identifying these and coming to consensus about what to do with those, uh, that Matt would be keeping that list and at some point begin bringing those actual amendments forward through the regular process. Is that reasonable? I, I think so. I mean, I Matt? Uh, so uh, from a staff perspective, like you just mentioned, things that you want to the consensus around things that you want to change is one of the, the key things that we want out of this process. Mm -hmm. um, another one, uh, we've talked about this some, would be if there's any prioritization uh, to those things. Um, and really that information can help drive forward how we move forward. If there's uh, 
multiple levels of priorities or things like that, then it may make sense to, you know, have staff come in piecemeal. If there's, hey, you know, we need to do everything all at once, then it may come in and we say, hey, we need a consultant to do something like that. So if staff needs to explore how that would, would happen. But um, until those, those kind of key products are determined, um, that's really going to feed into how we can proceed going forward because if it's, uh, like I said, if if we have these laundry lists of priorities that are all high, uh, you know, I may not be able to, to tackle that myself. I may need additional assistance to do something like that. So it, it really kind of, the way I proceed going forward is going to be related to how this board, you know, comes to a final product and what that final product looks like. You know, like I said, to me, the, the simple, simple, obvious things are it's something that doesn't need to be there, so we remove it. Mm -hmm. Or there's something that is a genuine conflict and we need to make a decision one way or the other how to resolve it mm -hmm. that are creating problems for staff. And so to me, we don't need to wait and do some consultant update thing. That's sure. something we should be able to do in-house along the way as we're going through this. Yes. So Matt, do you think then that the direction the steps that we're going to go through and what our end result is going to be at the end of the review, do you think that is satisfying what town council is looking for us to achieve in this process? Or are, or are that, I mean, are they ready for us to bring changes to them? Uh, I mean, that, that's a great question uh, that I don't really have that answer in front of me right now. Um, as we mentioned, we, the, the direction we've got right now is to conduct the audit. Okay. You know, the, the, the findings of the audit may direct how we get feedback to proceed going forward as well. Um, and and if, Madam Chair, if I may make a mm -hmm. comment, I think one thing that struck me first time I looked through this UDO was the very time I, first time I opened this book and saw all the complexity and pieces and parts of it. And one thing that struck me and that I was excited to see on this first page of this August 11th document was an organization of the document with chapters versed, under, referencing people where to go to find specific information. So I think that's a great first start, just as someone who just looked at the UDO in detail. Um, and then as I looked at, at the commentary here for sections one through six, it seems that where we may be hung up is just in the mechanics of trying to figure out how to set the priority and what to recommend to council. Would that be an agreement of, of, the, of the board here? Yes. But, but so, so it seems like, as I just perused these last night, it seemed that many of them, to Dara's point, are uh, what I would consider cleanup, housekeeping, grammatical type things that maybe if these could be classified as that versus a true conflict that the board needs to resolve and address, that might be helpful as we go through the process. Would that be a reasonable request, Matt, <coughs> is for you to take these items and tell us, is it just a cleanup housekeeping or is it truly a conflict that the board needs to bring some recommendation to council on? Uh, it, and I, I was gonna say the, the, the contract to perform this audit is with the COG, so I would defer to the people actually doing this this process for us as far as okay, what kind fair. of product we can expect and, and from so their standpoint. What, what I would say, you know, in order to not waste time or whatever it may be, in your review, folks, um, if, if there's things that you have noticed, Wes, could you help me understand that more? Or Wes, this seems like this is something that's very important. Do you agree? Or can we talk about this more as something that, as a board, we feel like is very important to address? That's where we we know what what is grammatical or whatever or, or things that need to be cleaned up. But we also don't have the authority just to initiate, initiate modifying your ordinance. Um, so, in your review of this, it, it is you've seen comments or you have notes. Say, can Wes? Can you help convey? Help me understand that. Or Wes, um, we feel like this is a real, this is a real big priority. That that helps us understand what was what's necessary. And you guys are working in your advisory capacity in that way. Madam Chair, I guess one last comment. Sure. We have no clear path from going through where we are today to when we're gonna to get to the end. I've asked for that twice now, and it's, you know, it's not that my question is misunderstood. There is no clear path. 
Last time we met, we heard about other groups that have to review this before uh, this COGS uh, consulting effort is over. So there's the planning board, which is, you know, 160D uh, justified. And then there's three other groups that have to review this, uh, this I, I don't even know what it is, the findings, the recommendations, our gut feelings, our smell, our uh, dislike. Uh, but I guess it's obvious now. So I, I thought it was me. It's obvious. There is no direct uh, path. I think what we should do is let's just start and see where this goes, because without direction, let's start somewhere. I was just going to suggest that we get started. Thank you, Bob. Um, and on the general code audit summary, uh, quite frankly, there's certainly sections from uh, from Section 2 and the administrative dealing with planning board. I think that's fairly easy to resolve, the six on aviation. Uh, but some of the things in chapters 8, 10, and 14, mm -hmm. quite frankly, I found it difficult to try and go through that without a hard copy. It, so we don't have hard copies of the, or I don't have a hard copy of the code. Uh, so <laughs> if we could get hard copies of uh, chapter 8, chapter 10, and chapter 14. Uh, I think that would be helpful to me. Certainly would be. Uh, I didn't see those. And so, um, yeah, can, is it? Are we able to pull it up here? Sure. Yeah. Madam Chair, we can pull it up here potentially. I don't yeah, know I'm, if that would be I'm helpful. I pull it up at home too. Okay. But I'm saying. Oh, to have hard copies. Hard copies. Got it. Yeah. So, um, if, if the board would like hard copies, I mean, we can wait on that section until you've, you've received them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Chapter 2, uh, of course, all that is was still lingering information when we made the changes during the uh, 160D process to the planning board section of that. Um, and I think I did something with that in Chapter 3. Uh, there were some, some changes in, in that ended up, that's in Section 3.3, .3, Article 3 in the UDO. Um, there are some changes that need to be made there, but, but basically I think we would do well to go ahead and eliminate the planning board section in the general code, just like we did with the Board of Adjustment. And there's maybe one thing in there that needs to shift over, and and some again some amendments when we get to Article Three. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just feel like it's time to go ahead and finish that off. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? You're talking about the planning board. The I'm talking about the planning board section in the general code in Chapter Two. We, we've actually already taken action to take it out of the UDO and put it. Council took action to do that. And then, for some reason, when the no, transfer the UD the 160D changes were made, it was put back in the UDO. Right. But it was never discussed at the council level. So, um, but there's there's still code okay. remaining. There's right. It shouldn't be in both places. It, right. It, and and so it should all be in in. I think it's last time council addressed it specifically. <coughs> it was to put it in chapter two. So that to me would still be a council question. So, but but that's some of, yeah. I agree that it needs to begin one place yeah. and one place only. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Uh, chapter six on the aviation. Uh, I think all of that needs to be updated <laughs> to current language and uh, incorporated all of it in the in the UDA. Um, I think what's hanging out there uh, in the general code for all of that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense at this point. It did at one time. But I'm reasonably sure there's some outdated elements in that. Mm -hmm. And some the definitions and so forth just has, has been pointed out here. Uh, 
and the, the overlay, having the height control overlay on the official zoning map mm -hmm. and updating all those terms and just not having it referenced but actually having it moved. Right. Would seem the most reasonable course. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I think the, the key piece on that was something about the 50-foot height limit, uh, but there were some, some conflicts even within that on some other things that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some of the development approvals preserved comes into mind uh, was limited to that because of the proximity to the airport. Like I said, I personally would like to have Chapters 8, 10, and 14 in a hard copy that I can, can look through before uh, before I'd be ready to. The business ordinance? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <coughs> and then Article 8, or Chapter 18 is, um, of course, we still got the flood, we got the subdivision ordinance. Uh, sorry, stormwater ordinance there. Mm -hmm. uh, the only mentioned the stormwater ordinance, but didn't say anything about the uh, in Article Five. There's also an Article Six on illicit discharge. Does that need to, if that's ever moved, does that need to stay where it is, or does it need to move to the UDO as well? Chapter eighteen. Chapter the, eighteen. The corridor. Mm, no, chapter 18, there's an Article 5 here. Yes. But there's nothing about Article 6, which is, was illicit discharge, separate ordinance. It's not that, the, mentioned here. That should, I don't believe that that's necessarily needed. That's a different thing unrelated to um, development. Right. But we We're do kind of trying to keep the nuisance, these sort of things, in the code. Code and just move the development kind of things. There. Yes, or we need to make sure that we're making reference, calling out that that we do have stormwater, for example, uh, in Chapter 18. Yeah, I think it's I think it's there. I think it just may not be there in enough places. Right. But, but I would even say that um, it would be a good time to move those provisions to the UDA when we actually do some significant update to the stormwater ordinance. I, I agree. I think it could be its own section or its own article. Yeah, but but again, just to move it for the sake of moving it, I, I would prefer to see that in the process of some updates to that ordinance. And I understand that uh, from Rick Patterson's presentation to us earlier this year that uh, there may be some things that they're working on to come forward from staff level about doing that and that maybe that would be a good time to to do that to do the move but again if 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 that is longer rather than shorter in coming in there are other places in the UDO now that don't appropriately reference back to that then that would certainly be something that could be added sure Now, the um, corridor development standards in Article 7 in Chapter 18 uh, would certainly need to seem like the recommendation to move that into the EDO and put it on the zoning map as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Have any comments on Chapter 18 on the stormwater and the transportation overlay? <coughs> uh, the question of whether or not uh, any of those corridor standards might need to be uh, adjusted at some point is, is a beyond the scope of I right. think what we're trying to look at here. Yes. And there may be some 
There may be some other quarters we want to look at, but that's a, a different issue. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Sort of a point of information. Mm -hmm. Would you ex maybe explain what you were just doing and how you were talking through these things? Because I think what you were doing, we, we have a UDO, which is now a, an appendix to our ordinances, and they used to be part of the ordinances in different chapters, mm -hmm. and so weren't other things like stormwater and land use and even the organization like planning board. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're doing is adding some other things that aren't in this scope into the scope that to get help get further clarification to do further clarification of our ordinances right i mean when you're talking about the chapter 18 and 14 and so forth those are the the ordinance is not the udo and, and well it's, i'm i'm on chat i'm on page three at the top of the page and that was part of the general code audit summary that's where i am okay and so it's part of the audit right well, I think, and we want to we want to do as much cleanup as we can and get, okay. Uh, so these are some recommendations. We're just, I'm just talking through and, and. Uh, okay, so you've jumped into this summary section and attacking it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I thought that was clear. My, my apologies. No. Uh, that's 26, I guess that's chapter 26. Um, and maybe if you could if you could pull that up on the, the screen, it seemed to me, Wes, like there was that everything in that section could actually be um, incorporated into the either subdivision or uh, development approval process. Something in the UDA. There was one other piece in there. You can pull that up. <coughs> Yes, um, and I've got a copy of mine, but um, Lisa's pulling it up. Mm -hmm. And I believe that technically it would apply. Um, question of it applying in the ETJ, I'm not so sure. Um, but I believe that that's generally the position of the <clears throat> of the town um, um, on on street lighting. But yeah, it seemed that there were more things in 26 and just 26.2 and 26.61 that were still left in there that um, and Lisa brings that up. Um, I don't have can't get it. I just need Mike to turn it on in there. Oh. I'd let him know. Okay. You are crowded. They may need to. Oh, you know what? It would probably help if I plug the cord in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this 26.2 is the street line. Now, after that is the, uh, on the underground utility. If you could scroll down, Lisa. And excavations, I mean, in other words, all of, all of this section <coughs> is not addressed in the audit, but my question was, yeah, just that, that Article 2 piece there, I guess. That, 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 would, that, would stay, that would stay as is because street lighting would apply to if you're doing a new subdivision, for example, mm -hmm. and talk about incorporation of street lighting. But if you're damaging existing uh, existing or you're excavating existing utilities. Okay, so that'd be like the illicit 
discharge that, and the, it's a the, nuisance yeah. sort of that's right think yeah. lack of a better word to clarify yes. okay and so then the 22 26 2 would be something that could be in the subdivision regulations that's correct and the 2661 if you scroll down to that Lisa. yes um, because 2661 B mm -hmm. talks about the development services department designating proper lot numbers for the street address for any dwelling right and that's that's something that you know I know that there's anyhow that that needs to be fleshed out and but if, if if that's part of our development approval process then we need to have it in the in the UDO yeah. and then 62 what's below that there's a couple of things below that um, so that's an after the fact kind of thing right yep okay yeah I wasn't sure if everything in there just so if anything else items. needed to yep. okay Was there agreement on the recommendations for those two items? Anybody have any further comments on those? Okay. And of course, chapter 32, our vegetation ordinance, we're all pretty well familiar with that, those of us who have been here and even, uh, I think, our two new members. Um, the first couple of articles deal with town property and some other things. What really impacts uh, development is the uh, is the Article Three. That's correct. Yep. I know we have some different standards for. Um, it's a lot of landscaping kind of things for um, vegetation piece I guess in the multifamily in the UDO some of those standards are commercial um, but all of this is just applying to uh, to residential do we want question here is about including different standards for new subdivision proposals or large commercial development projects could you speak to that um yes, yes typically um typically local governments if they're gonna if they're gonna regulate they're gonna have tree preservation tree mitigation etc they may have a uh, particular provision for um your single family your duplex you know your smaller type development on planting trees back or how many trees can be removed and then they may have oftentimes a different a different rule in place for like a large subdivision for example that were to come in uh, and, and and it would relate to you know how they're either preserving or mitigating trees on their site um, and it would be it would be a different um, calculation um, whereas um, you may save may say on a on a single family house on an already platted lot you have to keep tr two trees or whatever it may be um, or and then on a commercial project you may have to plant back a certain amount of what you've removed um, or you may have a priority based on preserving certain very specific um, specimen trees for example um, but I'll but it's often recommended that you have different different standards for those two items. Which now basically we have standards for what's already platted. Yep. Um, and some standards for commercial development within that. Yep. But nothing beyond that. Correct. I certainly think that's something that would bear looking at in the future. Um, now, the the change on the bush hog, and we did something else with bush hogging in that last amendment, did we not, Matt? <coughs> Most the amendment that's going to council. Um, 
next week. We uh, we defined we do required site improvements on the last one. I don't know that we just touched bush hogging as a portion of that. On the tree. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. We made was it two changes we made to that? Uh, we made a change. We the made a change board recommended the a change to the placement of the trees. Recommended, and change. then the definition of what's a required site improvement. So those ah, areas okay. that are okay. where you can remove things, essentially. Uh, we, but we didn't we didn't touch on the specific definition for for bush hogging. No. Right, because we we define tree now as two dbh right. or higher. Uh, you're just looking at this recommendation here uh, on bush hogging, which would, in other words, if we changed our definition to tree of to from two to three, that would would do that. But um, just by way of explanation, we were requiring two dbh for replacement trees as a minimum. And so the thinking was that in defining the, you know, what a tree is, it's two, and that would include bush hogging. If we're going to let them replace a tree with two inches, we'd rather have an existing tree at two inches. And so that's where the two inch standard came from. Got it. So I think, I think just clarifying, you know, that subject to not removing any trees to, DBH or less, for example. Um, well, and, and again, th that's how tree is defined in it. So the two is, is in the definition piece of that. Um, and from what I understand, there may be some recommendations coming forth from the um, Environmental Advisory Committee is working on some kind of a almost an overhaul again uh, from a different perspective, as I understand it, for the tree. So, so I think um, in terms of, of uh, changing what's there right now uh, would probably not be something we need to look at Correct. again. Yep. But still in the future, considering uh, the different standards part, uh, that's certainly something that <clears throat> Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Comments? Good with that? Wes, do you need have anything else that you need on the chapters that have been mentioned so far in the general code? No, ma'am. And, and really, I mean, I understand that's sort of technically outside you guys' purview. We just want always review those just to make sure there's things that are not outstanding. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, and, and because of the nature of how we've pieced back and forth between all of that, and there's some even some reference going back to some of these chapters that are in the UDA, yeah, until, until you make that clean break, that's... Um, and get all the development-related stuff in one place. Correct. Make sure that because of the way it's been done, that there's not anything else lingering in there. Uh, okay. So that's the general code piece. Um, <coughs> let's see. So that brings us to uh, Article 1 and the UDO itself, and in section 1.1, let uh, me just go down the, down the list, section 1.1, no change recommended. Uh, I would concur with that, that's simple enough. Uh, 1.2, under authority, um, there wasn't a change recommended, but there's, Wes, one of the things that I noticed um, in that 
last sentence in the first paragraph mm -hmm. owned by the state pursuant to blah, blah, blah. Um, Then there was a recommendation from general recommendation about M1.3.4.2. About state owned lands being only when a building <coughs> is involved. Plus, there seemed to be some, I don't know, that just caught my eyes. That's. Um. Double doing somewhere else. Yeah. <clears throat> I would remove, probably remove 1.3.42. Mm -hmm. And because as a result of 160D, it, it now has been made clear that you can regulate navigable waters of the state. That's okay. in particular related to, for you all, would be aquaculture, oyster leases, things of that nature, signage. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a question of that in the past. It now says that specifically in 702, 160D-702. Right. And I'm, I was a little bit, um, a, a little bit, it seemed a little bit odd for that 1342 there. I mean, you cannot regulate um, um, farm buildings, things of that nature, but that's a wholly different thing than, than state-owned lands. Right. So that would, would kind of add the, I guess she specified frequently. Uh, state on land provision established, not required to be included. Yeah. So, so, so the 1.3.4.2 would be deleted, correct? Yes, that would be my recommendation. If the town, for example, wanted to. <laughs> regulate signage or aquaculture, for example, on the on the ICW, um, someone could say that this provision pre preempts that. 1342. Okay, 1.3. Okay, 1.3, and there's several... Madam Chair, if I can yes. just make a minor comment. Sure. In the process, because I was taking notes and, and did when I reviewed this, 1.2, I said this is a minor comment, 1.2 is, is proposed to become, well, you know, again, let's not go too far and say proposed, but in the new organization, it would become 1.3. So it's, it, authority would still stay, but with the new organization, we'll put it in a, a section two, which would be which would be an effective date. And so 1.2 authority becomes 1.3. So just as a call your attention to that. And this 1.3.4.2 is now recommended to be removed, but that's not on any document that we have, right? OK, Correct. so it's well, a new item. Well, it's <clears throat> Madam Chair mentioned that as a specific item, there's a clause in here. There's a clause under 1.3.4. Yeah. Um, the state on land provisions are established uh, not required to be included in the town's UDA. So that's the 1.3.4.2 is what that sentence is referring to. Yeah. Uh, and since it's not needed to be, doesn't need to be included, uh, and given the other statement, uh, with state-owned lands in 1.2, uh, that should be deleted. Yes, in addition to 1.3.43, I mean, you, we, we define specifically um, subdivision elsewhere. What What is and is not a subdivision, that's all statutory. Um, and there's ways that you handle that. You reference those as what are terms to be exempt plats. You can still require certain things for them, um, but the way the language is in here at present um, could be problematic for the town, in my opinion. 
Yeah, so the, the 1.3 point, all these points, 1.3.4.3, uh, that whole section with all the bullets, that's already in our subdivision definition. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, there's a there's a sentence to that effect in the in the audit as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it talks about subdivision address and definition should be included in the subdivision article. So, so that's saying remove that from here. Yep. Put it also in the article as well as in the definition. Yes, it would be addressed in there. Um, it would it would be in your subdivision article, and then in your administrative procedures, there'd be a provision for um, exempt plats. Mm -hmm. which are not subject to the definition of subdivision per state statute. In other words, if you want to recombine a recombine a parcel, for example, there's certain things that we're, we cannot, that the town cannot ask for. Right. But based on this language, someone could call into question whether or not the town can ask for anything at all uh, because the town does want to have indication of some type of instrument or some type of plat for compliance of those particular exemptions to make sure they are in fact exemptions um, and, 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 and in the fact that the folks are creating new lots, et cetera. Would, would this piece with the subdivision be something that, of course we haven't even gotten a subdivision yet, but would that be something that, that would rise to a priority level? I would say that it would be. Um, as, a, as a potential I, conflict? I don't think or? it would hurt. I think it. I think it's interpretation matter, but I think that it 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 could, as it is now, it could afford some nefarious questions of folks okay. from an interpretation standpoint of whether or not they have to do certain things that they have historically done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 1.3.2, uh, this is one of the questions I asked. The, in addition to other locations required by law, I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I was wondering what the other locations referred to. Huh. I believe that's, that may be right out of the statute, if I recall. Um, typically in the clerk's office is, is but I'm not, Sure, but that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to look up. I believe that's under two o four, but I would have to look that up. Okay, if you could make a note of this. Mm -hmm. um, you list here in recommendation about moving one point three point three to another location. Um, Where? I mean, did you have something particularly in mind? So, in general, um, when when you are seeking some type of development approval, um, there's overarching clauses similar to this that are put in place in other locations of the ordinance, typically in your administration and procedure section. Mm -hmm. That seems to be um, sort of just hanging out there. Yes. There's a lot about this section that's that is uh, haphazardly there. in there. Uh, we're, we're, if it's we're talking about there. jurisdiction, that's mm -hmm. fine. Let's talk about jurisdiction, um, you know, and talk about the, the, the town's planning jurisdiction. But um, if we're talking about other matters, those other matters are more appropriately to be in administration and procedures and things of that nature. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, now, one point. 3.3.1 seem to be somewhat already covered. And that was something that was added from the 160D update. Uh, but in looking at it now in larger context, uh, 
because it talks about ETJs in 1.3.1. My question was, does it, are we already covered? Yes, you do and not so, need that language so in there. So should we, rather than uh, move that section 1.3.3, uh, that we could just eliminate it. All of 1.33 and 1.331 would make sense because uh, if, if the 1. town... 1.331, eliminate that piece, yeah. Yes, if the town were to proceed with um, increasing the ETJ, they'd be subject to the statutory requirements anyway. whether or not it's in the ordinance. Right. And there's a host of things like that in here. We're not looking to do that. Um, but yeah, it seems like the 1.3.3 is misplaced, needs to be put other places. Mm -hmm. But the 1.3.3.1 just needs to be removed because it's the statute. Would, you just don't need to restate the statute. Correct. <laughs> In this instance. Yep. Madam Chair. Yes. One one question I have is does it does it make sense to have jurisdiction and exemptions no, it doesn't. together? No, it doesn't. <laughs> that that's yeah, that's that's okay. why it's mm -hmm. yes. Because the two are really, you know different. Yeah, the one point three point four and I dropped down a little bit with the subdivision piece. We talked about deleting the 4.2. The 4.1, um, that little phrase on vested rights certainly needs to, to go, even if you move it somewhere else. Uh, But maybe keep the rest and but put it somewhere else with the exemption, or is that really? Hmm. Not really exemption per se, is it, Matt? Uh, Wes. Pardon. One point three point four point one. Yes, I. It is not an exemption, and I, yeah. and 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 I take. I, I think that that's problematic because um, they may have site specific vesting for something that that um, triggers requirement with something else that they don't have vesting for. Mm -hmm. But then this more or less is a blanket exemption for them. And I've seen this similar provision used in another local government by someone challenging an item and it did not end favorably for the town. Uh, the site site specific vesting rules are valid whether or not frankly they're in your ordinance you do have them in your, in your ordinance which is mm -hmm. fine but I would not claim that you're exempt just carte blanche as a result of this so the entire are you saying the that entire section needs to go that would be my recommendation yeah. I, as my comments stated you know this could be interpreted much more broadly than intended mm -hmm. on a number of things so, so under the, the three pieces of 1.3.4, uh, what we're saying is delete point one, delete point two, and move point three to the subdivision. Mm -hmm. And and 4.3 is already... It's okay. already, yeah. It's already in there. It already exists. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my question was, I mean, if we could just... I mean, do we do we need to restate that somewhere else other than the definition? Technically, you don't. Uh, I would put in the definition, and again, I, I always recommend had it, having procedures for exempt plats, uh, so that so that there is a process by which UDO, UDO administrator is reviewing those um, to to make sure that they are in fact exempt from the definition of subdivision so that someone's doing a, there's certain criteria that, that, that allows them to do that. Um, if, if you, 
Um, so that that's all. So I'm still not clear on the point three. Are we just going to delete it and not put anything anywhere else, or are we going to move some parts of it to subdivisions? Believe um, I would just I don't recall if I had a recommendation specifically for for um, um, in Article Two. Well, you said uh, subdivision definition addressed in the subdivision definition should be included in the subdivision article. Yes. So, so we we remove this, but whatever we said about exemptions, it needs to be addressed in administration or subdivision article specifically. Okay, and not here. It's odd that it's in that location. It, I agree. That's Terry coming now. Okay, uh, one point three point five. which also references 1.3.4.3, which we were just talking about. Um, yeah, 1.3.1.3. So, yeah, you, you didn't, there, there weren't any specific references to 1.3.5 or 1.3.6, but um, it seems to me like 1.3.5 is still continuing to talk about subdivision it, it is. issues There's and a, needs to be moved. Yes, it's a new special class of subdivision called an ex expedited minor um, that the local local government can only require a minor subdivision plat if it meets certain criteria. It's got to be over five acres and subject to those particular items. Yeah, so, so, so all of that... Mm -hmm. would be going as well. Mm -hmm. The question, 1.3.4.3 refers to not greater than two, and then five talks about, I mean, it seemed to be some gap between what happens between two acres and five acres, the way the thing's worded. That's just what the General Assembly has put in place. That's just yep. odd. Well, the five acre is... You know, if it's a, it's supposed to be catered to a larger tract. Right. The three into two has been a historic provision. Um, um, the two and the three, uh, so long as you're not including infrastructure, roads, et cetera. So what happens to three or four acres? It, you it, you would be subject to all the all the rules of the town's UDO for subdivision. So if, if, for example, you had a three acre tract mm -hmm. and you wanted to divide it into six lots or whatever it may be that triggers ma major subdivision, um, then you'd come, you'd come here for that preliminary uh, plat. None of this would apply. None of that would apply, that's correct. Yep. That's just, yeah, okay, Never mind. Right. <laughs> Does that ever come up as being a... We just, I mean, we don't have enough time to, we just hope, hopefully have enough time to take into account the state's changes whenever they may happen, but we don't question them. Okay. There, there is a recommendation on simplifying or modifying the, you know, what level of plats mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. are, are, what level of subdivision are sent for um, outside board approval. Um, versus internal approval, but that's included in the in the audit as a as a recommendation. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Matt? Um, no, I mean this section one point three point five, uh, similar to the exemptions, is is listed in the state statutes. It's something that we're required to do, regardless of whether there's any uh, local ordinance uh, provision for it. Um, to my knowledge. Uh, I remember when this arose, uh, there was some discussion that uh, the state statute for subdivision regulations uh, said that local jurisdictions could have expedited reviews for certain classes, was typically called a minor. 
um, but many did not. Uh, and so that there was a provision for uh, essentially the, the state legislature said, well, we think that there, there should be something for everyone. And so they applied this kind of blanket minor uh, subdivision process uh, that essentially if you meet these requirements, the only thing we can require is a final plat. Um, and that, that's my recollection of, of when this came forward. It's only a couple of years old though. It's, it's pretty new. Most places, I've only ever seen it used once or twice yeah. in, in my experience. But again, that along with uh, 3.4.3, 1.3. Yeah, three point five. Mm -hmm. Those need to <coughs> whatever what we're, we're going to have with that needs to be moved from there to That's the good. subdivision ordinance. Yeah. And one point three point six just seems like something that just although I don't think it was necessarily specifically directed in the or mentioned in the recommendations. Wes, uh, why should that be there? Why should it be there? Or point three point six about the ETJ and the bona fide farm and stuff. Um, it's applicable without. I mean, you. I typically address that as potentially as a as a definition for bona fide farm that applies. You don't necessarily need it internal to your ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, so long as there's specific procedure for what applies as a bona fide farm. And I'll say one thing in your ordinance is unclear because there's other locations where there's discussion about other activities that uh, potentially are exempt in the ETJ from um, from planning and zoning regulation, but it appears that they're in here as exempt within your corporate limits, which you don't have to do. Um, and, I, and I believe that it would be in the, the intent of the town not to exempt things within their corporate limits that, that they don't have to do. Um, and it, it's a little bit unclear. That's just how I typically address it. And if someone has a bona fide farm, luckily for you, you don't have a big ETJ and I don't anticipate it being a big issue. And some of our larger jurisdictions, in particular um, county jurisdictions, this is a whole nother ball of wax for them um, in terms of how they, they manage it. But it should come up very little at all. And I think a simple definition of bona fide farm it would be sufficient. So does that say take this out and do a bona fide farm definition or not? It, it says, um, I mean, it technically doesn't have to be in there, but um, it's okay to leave it. It's okay to leave it. If, if, if you want to address it, I would just do a definition and call it a day would be, would be my recommendation. Comments? But I think it, I think it's fine to remove subject to e e either way the board feels. Um, well, but it does it does at least somewhat address jurisdiction, which is what this is supposed to be doing, as correct. opposed to most of the rest of this. So let's just leave it there for now. Okay. Okay. Uh, number f one point four. You're not recommending any changes. Uh, one point five. You're recommending just removing it, the language not being necessary, correct? All references. I mean, that's a. All references you do owe to articles or sections or to the articles or section of the UDO unless otherwise specified. I guess that may be in there trying to think about some of the references to the general code that I'm not sure in 1.5. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, seems to me, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure the point of that, um, but. I certainly wasn't. Um, okay, yes. Uh, and 1.6, so 1.4 stays like it is, 1.5 could be removed, 1.6. Um, I actually 
actually like 1.5. <laughs> I just I think since the numbers are are the same in some of the chapters of the code, I just well I was saying there may be yeah. some relationship there is why that did. That. I just okay. think it, it makes it clear. I mean, is there any real reason to remove no, it? You it can... just makes it more clear. I think. Sure. Yeah. Well, since you said that, Lisa, we'll leave it. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'll make you feel more comfortable. While I'm certainly, and it does no harm. I'm certainly. Right. Certainly willing to do that. Um, in 1.6, not recommending any changes, but but my question was in the first sentence after mm -hmm. ordinance. What's the who's they referring to? The the uh, the ordinance provisions themselves. Ah, so that's a good question. We're pretty in applying the provisions of this ordinance. Is there some better way to board that? Um, it, it could be, yes, interpreting the provisions. It's a pretty standard clause. Um, um, you can say such provisions for, for clarity. Yeah, just they doesn't seem... When yep. I see they, I'm looking for yep. a person like a UDO yep. administrator, or a, I'm not looking sure. for an ordinance. So, yep. so let's make that say, yep. refer to what it's referring to. Sure. So far, ordinances are not people. Right. Okay. Uh, 1.7. Yeah, that seems to be kind of like the other thing that we we're talking about before about like the exception, like the one point three point four point one yes seal. Um, so I would I would think that that would be uh, talk about consider removing. I would think we would remove that. Yep. Uh, 1.8. Got the Board of Adjustment. One point. 8.5.5. Eight about the penalty. Yes. Certainly removing that. Um, but then I had a question about mm -hmm. several appeals. Yep. Uh, 1.8.4.2 talks about an appeal to the Board of Adjustment. Um, And then there are a couple of other. It just didn't seem to me like some of the references in that in those were consistent. What the and 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 I would just say in general, um, references are important. But this document has an inordinate amount Number of references, of. cross references to things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, discussion about appeals overall will have clauses stating that. Any any appeal of the, the board of adjustments final decision is uh, sorry any any uh, an appeal of the UDO administrator's decision always goes to the board of adjustment without it st being stated in in, in, in in ten different places but yes it refers to four ten one um, which talks about appeals in general. Okay, so those are fine, but. They could be cleaned up, you know, if, if you right. if you wanted to. But there's it's not, not like, like it's, a, it's not a like it's saying something, substantive it's not, issue. It's not substantive in terms of there's an yeah. appeal going somewhere yeah. where it shouldn't go. Yeah. Unlike 
the 1.8.5.5, which you shouldn't be appealing penalties to Correct. Board of Adjustment. Yes. Okay. And so then 1.9. Um, yeah, that just states the original and any other amendments since then are referenced along the line. Yep. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair, I have a question on that. I think sure. Bob mentioned this earlier, moving the effective date to the beginning of the right. ordinance so it's on the cover page. Is that right. Just to yeah. keep everybody straight, right, we're going to move that up to 1.2. There's no change, but move it to 1.2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, a relocation. Correct. Yep. Okay. okay. Anybody have anything else in Article 1? Wes, do you have what you need from us in Article 1? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How much time do you have to be with us today? <laughs> I think we've got a, um, I think we've probably got another 30 minutes or to 1230 or what, whatever, however the board feels. I know that mm -hmm. Matt's got a pretty, you know, Matt's got a meeting as well at Go one. On. Yes. Um, okay. If, if, Madam Chair, if you're okay with 1230, um, unless- 1230 good with everybody? Well, my concern is that without t sort of time boxing or managing mm -hmm, or somehow mm -hmm. we're just going to keep meandering along and waste time and not be as effective as we could. But needless to say, it doesn't matter what I've been suggesting. So, Well, if you have a different idea than you just going section by section. There's, there's no process to this, Madam Chair, but what I was suggesting earlier was we need to be efficient and, and, and effective. I think if there's a lot of discussion, maybe we table something so that we can move or we time box it, take things offline. Different, you know, meeting best practices. And mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's too much to try to move at, with only 22 minutes left. I think we should just use the 22 minutes and perhaps we take take into consideration before the next meeting how to best use our time. I'm, I don't know how much, Wes, you expected to get through in this first meeting, but we're, we're through one article. Did, did you expect to get through more or all six? Sure. Well, we did do the training prior, but I, I will say that, you know, I, I guess in, in Article 2, you know, if there's, there, there is more substance to some of the, some of the comments in Article 2, for example, discussion about uh, development standards and there's a section on uh, section 212 that talks about location of carports things like that that um, you know I think warrant some additional discussion um, that 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 are a bit different um, I would have liked to be through a bit more but um, you know I think that we can go through as there's questions or or ha or what have you um, you know, and Madam Chair is going through this. I think is, is um, it, it, to, in in order to be thorough to address these questions that that the board has. Um, there is, you know, for example, um, uh, yes, identifying certain certain uses, et cetera. I mean, this is sort of the way that. That we got to go. I mean, we can we can try to speed it up as we go in the next couple meetings, but I don't sort of how how these. Right. Go. Well, well, with twenty two minutes left, sorry, Carrie, but with twenty two minutes left, do you want is Article Three something more, you know, uh, more of a bite, a smaller bite than trying to do Article Two? I, I don't, not sure what you were saying. I, it I like would Article just keep proceeding on if we can. Okay. With, yep. Carry on. Oops, sorry, Carrie. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. I know typically in my history with audits, I mean, 
Wes is being paid to help us highlight conflicts or risks that we have in our current UDO. So mm -hmm. maybe if we can just, would it be reasonable to just stick to the items that he's highlighted kindly here for us as opposed to going through every single section, even though to your point, Madam Chair, there probably are some things in here that need language cleanup or whatever. Maybe in the interest of time, to Bob's point, we just we stick to the items that Wes has highlighted here and try to get through those. Is that a reasonable suggestion? Except in the event there's something major that needs to be brought out, or and we, I mean, if there's general concurrence with items that I've that I've mentioned, you know, I guess we don't necessarily need to rehash them unless there's questions. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe before the next meeting, if any of you had other items that weren't addressed in the memo, maybe if you could send them like a week ahead of time mm -hmm. to Wes, yes. right. and then yep. that's Perfect. something that he could incorporate. Yep. Okay. All right, with the time we have left, let's press on. Uh, Two point one. Um, this is move the last sentence and delete the last sentence and move the section to development standards article. By development standards article, you mean? Um, Madam Chair, I believe that may be a typo, and thank you for 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 um, calling that out. Um, um, I think that that may be a typo. But y yes, uh, remove the last sentence re regarding co conflicting language. Um, that was just a comment. Um, they think that removing the section, moving the section was not. I, so it just depends. I would put it potentially in in, in Article One, or it, you know, but it but it could stay here. Um, or a development standards article addresses um, addresses things like parking, landscaping, things of that nature, et cetera. Um, I'm not. I'm not suggesting getting rid of, uh, getting rid of it uh, per se. It needs to be incorporated somewhere in your ordinance. Okay, and and there may be something to come back to when we get go back to chapter eight in the general code because there's an awful lot of references to building codes and things yep. in there that seem to conflict. So for right now, we'll just go with yep. deleting that last sentence and maybe yep. bringing that back later. Yeah, because it, it's already it's already. It's already mentioned in general code. Right. Uh, 2.2, 2. Uh, looking at moving the 2.2.1 to Article 3, 2.2.2. Mm -hmm. uh, 2. 2. to what would be um, permitted use tables, which would be in 6.2? Sure, yes. Ish. Or so however, where however that you, ends yeah. up. Yeah. Yes. Um, 2.2.2.3, you uh, recommending deleting that? Right. Yes. Because Planning board and town council don't. Well, well, now the statute says that if 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 there's an unlisted use, um, the that we have to choose the most similar use, and we can't require that someone go through a text payment. They can voluntarily do that, right. but right. but we can't can't do that. Another another issue with this provision is that it requires the UDO administrator to develop a text amendment in the event that this happens, yep. um, yeah. which is not a Big reasonable time. Yeah. thing for staff to go through, in my opinion. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so 2.2, so um, a yes on all those recommendations. 
Everybody good with that? Okay. 2.3. Um, removing the last sentence in 2.3.1 about interpretations appeal to the Board of Adjustment. Um, deleting the last sentence in 2.3.2 .2 and removing 2.3.3 altogether. Madam Chair, I have a mm -hmm. question. Sure. We, we reference the um, okay, never mind. I just answered my own question. Sorry about that. Okay. So is everybody good with the um, recommendations for 2.3? Point 1.2 point point and point 0.3. Okay. Mm, 2.4. Um, now, I have some heartburn with some of this, but... I, I, I know. Okay, so... 2.4.2... Um, Yeah, my my disagreement with removing that uh, was if digital maps no longer require a printed scale for interpretation or by state how it's determined, uh, and really looking at trying to address uh, split zone parcels and and deal with this in terms of split zone parcels if a district boundary divides a lot or a parcel. Um, and then, yeah, but, yeah, the it, Board of Adjustment piece, yeah, but, but there seems to be something in here in, in dealing with the split zone parcels and the way those are worded that I uh, was concerned about Losing just you know, go ahead and 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 delete the 2.2.4 but the 2.4.2 reword that to address the split zone parcels because it seemed like you you're um, have a potential to circumvent district boundaries by combining a lot. So I I would not necessarily recommend removing two. So this is in regard to split zone parcels. I wouldn't recommend removing it but revise it to state that more or less if it's a split zone parcel that you can use the portion of the parcel for for whatever uh whatever's permitted in the in the district in which it's located and and in that effect it almost becomes a de facto property line and that you're not moving a i mean imagine if this was a large tract uh and that all of a sudden you're allowed to move a a a zoning district boundary i don't i don't believe that that's what the intent is but it could be interpreted in that way and, and that's that if the way i was looking at it if it is a split zone parcel and it does necessitate this particularly if it's a large one modifying that the boundary location then someone needs to come in and amend them and amend, amend the map appropriately yeah okay yeah because because what I, my, my concern was that whatever we did here that we don't want to <clears throat> rezone I, something without going through the process. I, there's, and I, there seems to be real danger in doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it needs to be, you need, you can use this piece of the property for whatever it's zoned for, and for lack of a better way to explain it, more or less the, the zoning district boundary line becomes a de facto property line. You measure your setback off that, things of that nature. Mm -hmm subject to them re rezoning it and fixing that split zoning. And yeah, this whole thing about the 150 feet and all that, I mean, it just yep. seemed out of...
out of place. And, and again, I wasn't sure about when, on the scale. Uh, yes. So we can leave the scale in there. The the seemed like it needed to be rewarded. It could be. Um, if there's a question of interpretation on the zoning map, it falls within the UDO, UDO administrator mm -hmm. right, up, upon which it can then be appealed to to the Board of Adjustment. Um, you know, you can use the scale appearing on the map, but now they're digitally based, and so you're going to zoom in and then print something. I, 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 I'm open to however best you, you all want, want to um, handle it. But yes, I mean, I guess it could potentially come down to a historic map that had a scale in that event. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you have any? Uh, I'm like Wes, I'm pretty agnostic on, on it in general. Um, you know, if it, in a lot of instances, it's, it, you're right, it's gonna come down to some type of historic map where that original boundary line was determined. So in that case, it would make sense to use the scale that appears on that map at that time. Mm -hmm. So then do we add a sentence or something About that, the digital? that says yeah. mm -hmm. scales are not applicable on digital? Well, that would be applicable, but they just wouldn't appear on the map per se. I mean, it's sort of contained in a computer and, and you... you um, it's something that speaks to the digital maps that you're yeah. referencing here. So it'd be a revised, not a... I guess my, my point, and in, in, in I wouldn't want it to preclude some other more optimal interpretation mm -hmm. of, of what the actual zoning district boundary should be. Um, so, you know, it, it will fall on the U, UDO administrator to determine, you know, what, what they think is to be the boundary. Say that it were a, be appealed to the Board of Adjustment and someone says, well, it says that the UDO administrator has to use the scale. And that, you know, could be problematic if the U UDO administrator sure. did not use the scale <laughs> to make their determination. But that, that, does that make sense? I mean, we, what I would say is that if you wanted to do something, you could say that, you know, determination of appropriate boundaries subject to scaling, et cetera, is at the discretion of the UDO administrator based upon professionally accepted sources. There's always the opportunity then to, to appeal their, their determination. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. So that would be a revision? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then uh, revising the 2.4.4 uh, and then 2.4.6. Six. Um, yeah, the Board of Adjustment interpreting, they can certainly hear an appeal for a UDO interpretation, but not to no. outright interpret, so nope. that needs to go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And 2.5, um, just a simple update about the uh, reference to comprehensive plan. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Two point six. Um, so two yeah, point we, yeah. two two point six. Um, this this is again a rehash of a similar provision in, in your earlier in, in in Article One about you can only use land or et cetera for certain things. Mm -hmm. The inclusion of the clause subject to nonconforming situations. It, it nonconforming situations apply whether or not that provision is there or not. 
um, and frankly, I think is 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 problematic. <clears throat> That that was my that was my my so comment. So it'd basically be just striking out the subject. Yep. To Article Nine of yep. the Wrongful So it's just the um, the introductory phrase, mm -hmm. just striking that out. Of that mm -hmm. first and then consolidating yeah. that with one three two and the appropriate location in the ordinance about you know um, or sorry uh, one three. Somewhere in 1.3, we had some, you know, 1.3, we had that other language that needed yep. to be somewhere, but not necessarily there. Correct. That's correct. Okay. It's very important, but we need to have it in appropriate places. But it's just not in the right place. Um, and then 6.2. That seemed to be um, yeah, and that was an extra thing. It seemed to me like six two point six point two was something in the interpretation of definition. It, yes, it needs to go in the to, in, in, in the moved. list of common phrases or definitions. Yeah. It's odd that it's yeah, that a, it's located uh, there. Yeah. 8.2 <coughs> has the interpretation before the definition section. Uh, so it's, and whether or not it may conflict with something that's in that, uh, I'm not sure, but. Yes. But yeah, those, those just need to be revised or moved. Okay. Um, down to the wire. 2.7. Um, talking about being redundant, already in 1.6. Right, was conflict with the other regulations, so... That can be removed? Yep. Okay. I, I think so. All right, and that brings us to uh, 1228 and fees and some other things that might be uh, in this section need some more discussion. So if everybody's uh, amenable, we might just be ready to stop right there. Anybody else have any other comments on Article 2 down through what we've talked about through 2.7? Thank you. Wes, anything you'd like to say to us before we uh, adjourn? No, thank you very much for your time. I understand that this um, seems time consuming. Um, and uh, it is worth everyone's time, um, and and I, I certainly apologize if it if it if it is not. Um, that is obviously not my um, intention. Uh, we all have more important things to do than to waste our time. That's certain. So I, I hope that it is not. I hope that this will be an effective use of everyone's time, and there will be some functional use of this process moving forward for the town. I think part of the challenge is there are so many um, so many things that need addressing. I, I suppose that is a good comment. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Okay. All right. Um, and so we will get something on Meeting dates beyond October at our September regular meeting, or by our September, we'll be able to make that decision next week. Um, of course, our next UDO audit meeting is on a Wednesday, October the 12th. 
at 10 o'clock? That's, that's correct. Okay. And so and we will I have pick up off. where we left off and maybe, uh, I mean, I think it depends on the material. I know we all want to make sure that we don't gloss over any important details, uh, but we don't want to get bogged down. In I do have new material. Either. And we've got some more stuff to look at. Great. Madam Chair, I just have, yes. have one comment, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the process of going through this by article and section, and, and you know, we have to all keep flipping back to other sections and such, but mm -hmm. um, I, I really like Bob's recommendation about how to, how to categorize the changes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and maybe that's not the way we proceed through the audit, but at the end, I think it would be really helpful to say all of these, there were no change. All of these, we relocated, you know, all of these, we, um, and I, that's not to create a burden on anybody else to have to keep up with that. But for, for me anyway, I, there's real benefit to being able to see those different categories of what we did with everything. I agree. Um, like I said, most, so much of what we've talked about so far is, is you know, removal or remove some uh, definition type of thing. Uh, but to keep even even prioritize that itemization right. in terms of what we do. Right. Uh, certainly things that just need to be gone or need or conflict or need to be, you know, there's some wording that's, that's bad for us. And so we keep up with that. But yeah, I, I agree that having these categories will be helpful in terms of prioritizing after we've gone through that. If there's <coughs> a way um, that each of us can try and you know, code what we've done right. as we consider a, an item one, two, three, or four uh, on our own as we go through, then we'll have that. And, and won't it be easier when this goes to council if we have sort of a list of these were sort of cosmetic housekeeping things, things that were removed as redundant or whatever, versus here are the true meaty items that the council needs to consider? <coughs> Wouldn't that, I think that would be important differentiation to be able to make. Mm -hmm. and, well, that's kind of what we did with the UDO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, okay. and, with the initial adoption of it. Now. Right. And, and if, if I may, I mean. Or the ones that PD changes. I'm so sorry. When, <laughs> when we met last, we did talk about, you know, with this board t trying to talk about those big picture items and, and, and not getting too into the weeds on this stuff to the degree that we can and understanding what the true priorities, because as you can see, it's very easy to get in, into the weeds. And, and so, um, anyways, I, I'll just, I, I think that as we move forward, perhaps, as, as there's things that are truly important and critical, please point them out, or policy decisions, you know, that some of the, some of the other things will all, <laughs> always, will ultimately be addressed without necessarily us going through them. But. We'll just see how we do at, at the next meeting. Yeah, um, I, I think um, I think we'll we'll we we learn as we go along because none of us have ever been through this before. Uh, on in something like this, as far as I know, we've all been through some kind of audit process in some other uh, some other life, <laughs> but, but not not like this. Okay. Uh, so I appreciate everyone's uh, patience and diligence and uh, committed to, uh, to seeing this process through in uh, the most productive form possible. Saying that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, sorry, Matt. Just two seconds to everybody's time. You may have noticed a young man sitting in the back of the room. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brady Golden. Uh, he is our new planner one. He just started a couple weeks ago. Uh, so he's an entry level planner, comes to us from East Carolina University where he's uh, had a bachelor's of science in community planning and coastal studies. Uh, he's a North Carolina native, uh, grew up in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, so he's got a lot of knowledge and experience as far as uh, living in a coastal community. Uh, really excited to have him on board. He's gonna be working mostly with 
uh, current planning things, so plan review, uh, permitting, things like that. Uh, but as he grows in his role, uh, he may have the opportunity to come before you with some things. So please welcome him uh, as good as you've welcomed me here since I'm new to the town too. Uh, we're really excited to have him on board and just wanted to introduce him to everybody. So thanks, Brady, for coming. Oh, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Not coming back after today. Oh, coming. he's coming. He's <laughs> coming. He's writing his notice, writing his resume. Welcome, resume. Brady. It's good to have you on board. Appreciate you um, uh, sitting in with us today. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Bob. All in favor? This is unanimous. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next Thursday. Keys. That's why we knew.